the Great Reset, unmasking the collapse of Social Security and healthcare. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a hard look at the facts. The United States Social Security and healthcare systems are no longer what they were designed to be far from it. We are witnessing the systematic breakdown of a massive social experiment, one that aimed to provide dignity in retirement and health care for all, but which, instead, is hurtling toward collapse. What I am about to lay out may be a bitter pill to swallow, but it's a dose of reality. The so-called Great Reset, the agenda driving political and financial forces worldwide, might sound like a radical shift toward sustainability and progress, but don't be fooled. In reality, it's a deep restructuring of systems that have been intentionally driven to the brink. The unfortunate truth. Social security and healthcare in America are now so entangled in debt and dysfunction that they're dragging down the entire system. And like a crumbling bridge, they will inevitably collapse under their own weight, burdening future generations in the process. The history and the problem with Social Security. When Social Security was introduced in 1935, the intent was to offer a safety net for the elderly, those who, after a lifetime of work, deserve security in their later years. But let's not kid ourselves when it was conceived. Life expectancy was far lower. Most people would barely reach retirement age, and if they did, they wouldn't live on Social Security for decades. This was supposed to be a short term payout system for a few years at most. Fast forward to today, and people are living 20, 30, or even 40 years into retirement. The demographics have shifted the workforce to retiree ratio has plummeted, and the payments, are now stretching far beyond what the original creators envisioned. Here's the painful truth Social Security was never meant to be a long term, full scale retirement program for millions. The system was built on faulty mathematics, faulty demographics, and, perhaps worst of all, the faulty assumption that the economy would forever support an ever growing payout. Now, it's buckling. To meet these obligations, the government has resorted to printing more money, taking on more debt, and putting more burden on the shoulders of the younger generation. Let's call it what it is a classic Ponzi scheme, where new participants, the younger workforce, are paying out the benefits for the older generations. The real problem. This scheme can't go on forever. Healthcare is system riddled with cracks. Let's turn our attention to healthcare where the situation is just as dire. America's healthcare system, once the pride of the world, is now a labyrinth of bureaucracy, inefficiency, and mind-boggling expense. It's a system that rewards insurance companies, pharmaceutical giants, and corporate healthcare, while leaving the average citizen burdened with skyrocketing costs. The Affordable Care Act, for all its good intentions, merely patch a few holes in a sinking ship. Meanwhile, Medicare, a key pillar of health care for retirees, is also facing its own financial death spiral. The health care crisis in the U.S. boils down to this, it costs too much, covers too little, and, like Social Security, relies on an endless infusion of taxpayer dollars. If that supply dries up, the entire edifice crumbles. There are too many fingers in the pie, too many middlemen taking their cut, and too many incentives to keep the system complex, expensive, and profitable for those in power. What's worse, while the elderly rely on Medicare, the younger generation, already financially strained, is left paying for a system they can hardly afford themselves. The weight on the younger generation. Let's talk about this burden on the younger generation. They are entering the workforce saddled with college debt, dealing with stagnant wages, and struggling with an economy that has fewer opportunities. The cost of living continues to soar, and homely ownership on a hallmark of the American dream slips further out of reach. This generation, my friends, 
is asked to foot the bill for social security and health care systems that are consuming resources at an unprecedented rate. They are forced to pay into a system that will be depleted by the time they reach retirement. Consider this the Social Security Trust Fund is projected to run out by the mid-2030s. When that happens, benefits will need to be cut drastically, leaving millions of retirees at risk. As it stands, we're looking at a generation that will be left with nothing but the crumbs of a broken system forced to support a massive debt load left by previous generations. And we wonder why trust in the government is at an all-time low. The Great Reset, a global shift with American implications. Here's where it gets interesting. This is the Great Reset. The powers pushing this agenda understand the unsustainable nature of these systems. But instead of reforming them, they aim to let them collapse under their own weight. Why? Because the Great Reset isn't about helping the people, it's about consolidating control. A collapsed system allows for more government intervention, more corporate control, and more restrictions on individual freedoms. They've realized that if they can control the financial resources and healthcare, they can control the population. This is a new world order where citizens are shackled by debt, burdened by a failing healthcare system, and utterly dependent on the government for survival. It's a reimagining of our social structures where the few at the top retain power and the rest are subjected to policies that keep them struggling. Under the guise of the Great Reset, we're being sold the idea that the economy will be rebuilt, that our lives will be more sustainable and more equitable. But in reality, it's a game of control. The government will come in promising universal basic income nationalized health care, and a cradle-to-grave social safety net. But make no mystic ethos as merely a way to keep people dependent, disempowered, and ultimately controllable. What can be done? So where does that leave us? I will be blunt, we must seek alternatives. The younger generation can no longer depend on Social Security, Medicare to be there for them in their golden years. They must take steps now to build independent streams of income, focus on saving, and diversify their assets. Financial education is crucial. This means understanding the role of gold, silver, and other hard assets that are immune to inflation and market manipulation. Digital currencies, too, might play a role, but only if they are decentralized and resistant to government interference. We must also push for local solutions to healthcare. There's a reason why medical tourism has taken off in countries like Thailand, Malaysia, and Mexico. These places offer world-class care at a fraction of the cost, and they don't rely on the bloated, inefficient U.S. system. Perhaps it's time to consider a healthcare model that isn't reliant on insurance companies or a labyrinth of bureaucratic red tape. A time for self-reliance and vigilance. To survive this great reset, self-reliance and vigilance are essential. This is about reclaiming control of your financial future, your health care, and ultimately your life. The old systems are dying, but that doesn't mean you have to go down with them. Use this time to educate yourself, to build resilience, and to develop your own path forward. The reset is coming, but it's up to us to decide how we will navigate it. We can either submit to a system designed to keep us in check, or we can break free and forge a future on our terms. Remember this, the Great Reset isn't about fixing the system, it's about consolidating power. And the best way to resist is by refusing to be dependent on a system that no longer serves you. U.S. banks on the brink high interest rates, real estate woes, and a brewing financial crisis. Buckle up, because what I am about to lay out may shake up your understanding of where the U.S. financial system is truly heading. We're dealing with some serious vulnerabilities in our banking sector, and the mainstream narrative isn't telling you the full story. 
So let's get real. I am going to walk you through how these banks are piling up risks, especially with $750 billion in real estate losses and why high interest rates are creating a storm that's about to hit with full force. My goal here, to make it abundantly clear why investing in banks right now is like playing with fire. High interest rates the silent killer in the system. Let's start with interest rates. We've been in a low interest rate environment for so long that it's practically lulled the banks into a false sense of security. For over a decade, they were able to borrow cheaply, lend out money at a small spread, and make easy profits. But that era is over. The Federal Reserve has been jacking up interest rates to combat inflation, but those higher rates come with a price. Here's why higher interest rates increase the cost of borrowing for everyone, and banks are no exception. All those loans that banks issued at lower rates are now liabilities, because they're stuck with them on the books while funding costs skyrocket. That's a ticking time bomb. As interest rates go up, the cost to maintain those debts balloons. It's like trying to stay afloat while weights are tied to your ankles. And eventually, something's got to give. The 750 billion real estate meltdown an unforgiving reality. Now, let's talk about real estate, because this is where things get even uglier. American banks are sitting on roughly 750 billion in losses from real estate. And I am not just talking about residential properties here, commercial real estate is bleeding. Office buildings, Retail spaces and even industrial properties are seeing vacancies at unprecedented levels, partly thanks to the remote work revolution and partly due to a faltering economy. During the boom years, banks poured money into real estate loans with the assumption that property values would keep rising indefinitely. But here's the reality check when interest rates go up. Real estate values tend to fall. Why? because higher rates make mortgages more expensive, so fewer people can afford to buy, and that pushes prices down. Commercial properties, in particular, are taking a beating. In cities across the country, office buildings sit half empty, and many are barely worth the paper their loans are printed on. Imagine this, a bank finances a skyscraper in Manhattan when rates are low and property values are high. But now, rates have surged, and that property's value has plummeted. Tenants are pulling out, rents are falling, and the owner can't meet the loan terms. The bank. They're left holding a massive loan on a property that's worth less than what's owed. Multiply this scenario by thousands, and you'll understand the scale of this crisis. Liquidity drain why banks can't escape this mess. Now. The situation would be bad enough if banks were sitting on piles of cash to cushion these losses. But they're not. Due to years of reckless lending and share buybacks, many banks have drained their liquidity reserves. Remember, the banking system operates on fractional reserves, which means they only hold a small percentage of the money they owe to depositors. When you combine that with mounting real estate losses and higher interest rates, you have a recipe for a liquidity crisis. This isn't just a hypothetical problem that's happening. Banks are already dipping into their reserves to cover bad loans, and it's creating a dangerous feedback loop. As they use up cash to cover these losses, they have less to lend out. That, in turn, strangles the economy because businesses and consumers can't get loans. And with each passing day, the liquidity problem worsens, bringing the entire system closer to a breaking point. Why banking stocks are a bad bet. Given everything Ivy just laid out, it should be clear that bank stocks are a dangerous investment right now. When you buy shares in a bank, you're essentially buying a piece of a company that is dependent on steady cash flow and positive balance sheets. But U.S. banks are hemorrhaging cash, and the balance sheets are anything but stable. In the old days, 
bank stocks were considered a safe, boring investment. Not anymore. You've got these banks loaded up on assets that are rapidly losing value, weighed down by sky-high debt, and facing a rising tide of loan defaults. It's a bit like buying stock in a ship that's already hit the iceberg but hasn't fully sunk yet. Let me spell it out when those commercial real estate loans default, and they will, the losses will eat into the bank's equity. Shareholders will get wiped out, and anyone holding bank stocks will be left holding the bag. It's already started. Look at the bank's share prices they're down across the board, and we're just getting started. This is just the beginning of the bloodbath. The government's role a vicious cycle of bailouts. So what's the government doing about all this? They're preparing for another round of bailouts, but let's be clear bailouts don't solve the problem. They only kick the can down the road. The government bailed out the banks in 2008, and here we are again, talking about bank failures. Bailouts create moral hazard, which is a fancy way of saying that if banks know they'll be saved when they mess up, they're more likely to take bigger risks. And let's not forget the impact on inflation. Each time the government pumps money into the banking system to bail it out, it dilutes the value of the dollar. This means higher prices for everyone. So even if you don't have money in bank stocks, you're still paying the price for these failures. Inflation is a hidden tax, and the American people are footing the bill for the bank's mistakes. The future of banking a system on life support. Looking forward, I see two paths. Either the government steps in with a massive bailout, which will further weaken the dollar and drive inflation, or they let the banks fail, which could trigger a cascade of defaults. Either way, the banking system as we know, it is on life support. Some might think that the system will self-correct, but let me tell you, that's not happening. These banks are too deep in debt, too leveraged, and too exposed to toxic assets. They're beyond the point of self-correction, and every day they're inching closer to the edge. Protect yourself strategies for surviving the coming crisis. So what can you do to protect yourself? First, if you're holding bank stocks, it's time to reconsider. Look at the fundamentals and decide if this is really where you want to keep your money. In my view, safer investments are assets outside the banking system, like precious metals. Gold and silver don't rely on anyone's promise to pay. They are intrinsic stores of value, immune to the financial system's manipulation and meltdown. Consider also diversifying into hard assets and alternative investments. Real estate is an option, but be cautious. Residential properties in stable markets may hold their value, but avoid commercial real estate at all costs. The remote work revolution is here to stay, and that means demand for office space will remain low. If you're looking to buy property, Think strategically about locations that have growth potential independent of the urban office landscape. A system at the breaking point. In closing, the U.S. banking system is more fragile than most realize. Between sky-high interest rates, a collapsing real estate market, and dwindling liquidity, we're sitting on the edge of a major financial crisis. The banks are in trouble and anyone invested in them should take heed. I believe we're approaching a moment of reckoning, one that will redefine the landscape of American finance. This isn't fear-mongering its reality. It's time to wake up, assess the risks, and take control of your financial future before the system takes it out of your hands. The banks may seem untouchable, but history has shown us time, and again even the biggest empires can fall. And when they do, it's those who prepared who come out on top. The falling seal Janet Yellen, the dollar, and an ominous portent. We are living in times when symbolism and reality blend together in uncanny ways. Let's talk about a moment that, on the surface, might seem insignificant. But trust me, carries a heavy, 
unmistakable meaning. When Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, was questioned about the dollar's future as the world's reserve currency, something remarkable happened the United States seal fell right in front of her as she prepared to answer. Now, to some, this might look like a minor mishap, a simple accident. But let me tell you, this was no coincidence. If we were in ancient Rome, the priests would have been burning incense and interpreting omens after an event like this. That seal crashing to the floor is a symbol. It's a message, a forewarning, if you will, about the fragility of our financial system and the waning dominance of the U.S. dollar. The dollar's decline not just a symbol, but a reality. Let's get into what's really happening here. The dollar is in decline, and it's not just because of domestic policy failures or a bit of inflation. We're talking about the structural collapse of a currency that's been overextended, overleveraged, and overprinted for decades. The dollar became the world's reserve currency after World War IA under the Bretton Woods Agreement, and for decades, the U.S. was able to dictate terms globally. But now, we're losing that grip, and every own a nation's banks and investors is starting to realize it. Think of it this way the seal falling is the dollar falling. As the U.S. prints more money to cover an ever growing national debt, the value of each dollar slips. Inflation eats away at its purchasing power, and people start to question the very foundation of the currency itself. When the world's reserve currency loses credibility, it's not just a financial problem, it's a seismic shift in global power. We're seeing cracks in the dam, and it won't hold forever. Janet Yellen's response, a scripted dance around a failing currency. When Janet Yellen was questioned about the dollar's sustainability, she gave a response that was nothing more than political theater, a carefully worded dance around the truth. She said what you'd expect from a top official, that the U.S. dollar is strong, that it's resilient, that it's supported by a sound economy. But here's what she won't tell you. The Federal Reserve and the Treasury have been in a near constant state of crisis management since the 2008 financial collapse. Since 2008, we've seen quantitative easing, massive debt expansion, and artificially low interest rates to keep the economy from imploding. These policies are like pouring water into a leaky bucket. Sure, it buys you some time, but it doesn't fix the structural damage. And now, with inflation on the rise and interest rates creeping up, they're running out of tricks to keep the dollar propped up. A system of smoke and mirrors. Let's be honest, the U.S. dollar's stability today relies more on confidence than on substance. It's a system of smoke and mirrors held up by the illusion of American strength and the global inertia of using the dollar as a reserve currency. The petrodollar system teeing the dollar's value to oil trades was a clever move that kept demand high for decades, but even that is losing its grip. Countries like Russia, China, and India are increasingly trading in their own currencies, bypassing the dollar altogether. When the biggest players start moving away from the dollar, that's not just a red flag, that's a crisis in the making. So when that seal fell, it wasn't just an accident. It was the collapse of a carefully constructed facade. The U.S. dollar is teetering on the edge, and the world is beginning to see it for what it truly is a currency on life support, propped up by narratives and no longer by actual value. The consequences of losing the dollar's dominance Let's dig into what happens when the dollar finally loses its status as the world's reserve currency. Right now, the United States enjoys what's called an exorbitant privilege. This means we can print dollars as we please, and the world accepts them in exchange for real goods and services. But when confidence in the dollar evaporates, this privilege goes with it, and we're in for a rude awakening. Imagine what happens if global markets lose faith in the dollar. Suddenly, oil, manufactured goods, raw materials, none of it comes as cheaply 
to the United States anymore. We're forced to trade in other currencies or watch our costs go through the roof. Inflation. That'll look mild compared to the price hikes we'll see. And that's not even the worst of it. Losing reserve currency status would mean massive unemployment, staggering interest rates, and a return to economic realities that most Americans aren't prepared for. This is not some abstract theory. Just look at the British Empire as a historical example. Once the British pound lost its status as the world reserve currency, after World War II, Britain's economy suffered for decades. The U.S. dollar took its place, and America rose to power. The same cycle is repeating now, except the U.S. is the one in decline, and it's not clear who will take our place or what kind of global chaos will follow. Signs of an Economic Reckoning For years, I've been warned about the signs of an economic reckoning, and we're seeing them unfold. Inflation is just one part of the story. The Federal Reserve is in a catch-22 raise interest rates to curb inflation, and you risk choking off the economy keep them low, and you stoke even more inflation. It's like trying to hold a beach ball underwater eventually. It's going to shoot back up, and the longer you hold it down, the more violently it resurfaces. Then there's the matter of the national debt, which now sits at over $30 trillion. That's a number so large it's almost meaningless to the average person. But let me put it this way, if interest rates rise, the cost of servicing this debt becomes unsustainable. We're already paying hundreds of billions in interest every year, and as rates climb, that number will only increase. Eventually, we'll be left with two options default on our debt or print even more money to cover it, leading to hyperinflation. Either way, the dollar's value crumbles. The real omen a warning of what's to come. I want you to consider that falling seal as a warning a signal that the world is changing and the dollar is no longer the pillar it once was. Janet Yellen might say what she wants about stability, resilience, and confidence, but that seal falling tells a different story. It's a reminder that the financial system like that symbol of American authority, is unstable. Now, let's be clear, this isn't just a problem for the United States. The dollar is embedded in the global economy. When it falls, it's going to send shockwaves around the world. We're talking about banks, corporations, entire economies that rely on the dollar's stability. When that foundation crumbles, it will take much of the world economy with it, Protect yourself a strategy for the coming storm. What can you do to prepare? First and foremost, understand that the days of relying on the dollar's stability are over. It's time to start diversifying your assets. Precious metals like gold and silver are no longer just investments, they're insurance policies. Unlike fiat currency, they can't be printed at all, and they've held value through centuries of economic turmoil. You might also consider diversifying into foreign currencies, especially those from countries that have positioned themselves outside the U.S. financial system. The Chinese yuan, the Swiss franc, these are currencies backed by strong economies that may weather the storm better than the dollar. And if you're looking for digital alternatives, look into decentralized cryptocurrencies. Be cautious, of course. But in a world where the dollar is losing ground, diversification is the key. In conclusion, the time for complacency is over. To those listening, the falling U.S. seal is not just a quirky mishap. It's a sign. It's a moment to pause, to reflect, and to recognize that the financial landscape is changing. The American financial empire built on the dollar's dominance is showing cracks and the warning signs are all around us. This isn't the time for complacency or blind trust in the system. Janet Yellen can deliver all the reassurances she wants, but when symbols start falling, when trust starts eroding, it's a wake-up call. The dollar, like that seal, is losing its grip. 
it's time to prepare to protect and to make sure not left exposed when the dollar's inevitable decline accelerates. Ladies and gentlemen, the message is clear. Don't wait until the dollar's fall becomes an undeniable reality. The time to act is now.